our president, Deborah Rudder. Good evening. Welcome. And what a room full of great friends. We're thrilled to have you here. About a year, maybe a year and a half ago, David Rubenstein and I were having one of our regular breakfasts to talk about what we needed to do here at the Kennedy Center. And we were talking about these amazing interviews that he does with so many of our artists that visit us here at the Kennedy Center. And at that time, we thought, well, maybe we should expand it and open it up to audiences, because so often those interviews take place with just members of the board or something of that sort. It's taken us a little while to put it together, but it is perfect in this year when we are celebrating John F. Kennedy to create a new series called Profiles in Creativity with David Rubenstein. So tonight is our very first night, and as you saw with that fantastic video, I'm not sure we'll always be able to have such a great video because that was the honors video that we showed for Rita Moreno when she won uh, the Kennedy Center honor in 2015. Um, so this is the first night. Stay tuned for that spot. We hope you'll come often. Now, David Rubenstein, um, some people might have used to call him maybe reserved or shy, but clearly that's not who he is these days. A man with a syndicated television show on Bloomberg that's so impressive and so popular that they've re-upped him for another year, and PBS is now going to rebroadcast those next year. He is a true celebrity, and he is a fantastic, knowledgeable, great interviewer. So we are in for a treat. Thank you all for being here. Please welcome David Rubenstein and Rita Moreno. we can top the expectations, maybe we should just leave right now. I know, we could just get up and leave. So uh, I had the honor of meeting you for the first time when you were awarded the Kennedy Center Honors a few years ago. And um, you know, I wanted to ask you about that. Um, as a result of winning that Kennedy Center Honors, you have not only now won the EGOT, the EGOT means an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. And there are only 12 people who've won that. And only now I'm a key got. He got. You've got that too. <laughs> so, um, but who's counting? Well, there, <laughs> there are only two people who are key got winners who are women. One is you, and one is Helen Hayes. Um, but Helen Hayes never had a relationship with Marlon Brando. <laughs> so, I'm not sure you? that I did either, but I. Okay. <laughs> So you, I you think <laughs> uh, you kind of topped her by having a relationship with Marlon Brando? Pretty impressive. Yeah, yeah that's pretty good. So uh, on Marlon Brando, for those of us who might be interested in what his techniques we're were... We're starting with Marlon Brando already? Well, I, was just, I had on my mind. Uh, so for those of us who may not be as successful as Marlon so Brando... You are so Tell us, what was so appealing about him? What was... I mean, he was better than everybody else? Oh, absolutely. He was the king. He was absolutely, he was the king of everything, and uh, he certainly thought so. You know? I mean, but I, I, I remember the moment I met him, I was visiting a, uh, a set. I was always visiting sets and, um, at 20th Century Fox, and there was a, it was a film called uh, Desiree, where he was playing uh, uh, Napoleon. Very fitting. And I accidentally stuck my head in the makeup room and there he was. And I'm, I swear to you that the moment we set eyes on each other, the walls started to sweat. Oh. I mean, does that tell you something? Okay. Uh, well, he has something I don't have, right? <laughs> okay, I well, got it. Well, there were a couple of little bubbles up here. Okay. So, uh, um, well, when you had a relationship with him, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but. Um, you also uh, had a relationship 
with somebody else, you weren't feeling that Marlon Brenner was giving enough attention one time, so you develop a relationship with somebody named Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. But you've written That's that... That's the one that surprises everybody. <laughs> but, but you've written he wasn't very good at delivering the goods, so what did you really mean by that? <laughs> Well, he was no hound dog, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I mean, if you're going with Marlon Brando, and we had an eight-year relationship, and, uh, and uh, then uh, you want to make him jealous because you've been asked out by this other king of rock, uh, it, that's a lot of competition, really. And Elvis was a very sweet, really rather shy young man. He was wonderful looking. Uh, handsome, beautiful, pearly teeth, gorgeous hair. I don't know what that story about his dyeing it is ridiculous. That he did not dye his hair. But uh, he was also boring. Oh. Oh. I mean, uh, Marlon Brando, oh. Elvis Presley, he was a country boy for Pete's sake. And I say that with all the affection in the world because he was a nice kid. But man, that was no, no competition. No. <laughs> So when he's wooing, no, 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 no. But when he's wooing you, he doesn't sing romantic songs. At the, he didn't do that. When he was what? Wooing you. He didn't sing romantic songs ever. Wooing. No? He wasn't really wooing that much? No. He's a country boy, right. man. Okay. He didn't woo. How y'all doing? Well, I'm just fine, Elvis. How are you? I'm good. <laughs> Well, that's good, Elvis. Yes, good. So that was it. Okay. So, um, in your talk about your career, you've now uh, been in show business for more than seventy years, and uh, an incredible career. You've won all the kind of awards, every award you can possibly win. In addition, the Presidential Medal of Freedom, National Medal of Arts, every every award. Why do you think you've been so successful? Is it, you know, you had good genes, you worked harder, you're smarter, you're more talented. What do you think was why the reason? Why do I think I've been so successful? Yes. Why I you... have no idea. That's for you to say. Well, you, you... I mean, why do you think I've been so successful? Well, seriously. You, you, you worked very hard. You had a lot of innate talent. Uh, you practiced when you were very young, and mm -hmm. um, you were very driven, and uh, you had a lot of talent. How about that? Well, you know what? Here's the thing. I know a lot of people who did all of those things and haven't gotten as, as fortunate as I. And uh, so I, I know a lot of people who deserve all of the attention in the world, uh, all kinds of honors, and don't have them. So, you know, I really think it's in the lap of the gods. At a certain point, it's in the lap of the gods. I do. So uh, let's state it another way. Uh, you've been in show business for 70 years. Many people your age are watching their grandchildren. You're doing that too. but but they're not competing actively uh, in the performing arts world. Now, you are now filming a new show for Netflix, uh, One Day at a Time, mm -hmm. which... We're uh, going into our... <laughs> Thank you. In fact, we're going into our second season. We've been picked up. I'm so thrilled. And you must feel young there because um, Norman Lear is the producer, and he's 94, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we call me... I call us the two old farts. <laughs> So, um, why have you decided to continue your career? Not that everybody oh, doesn't want David, to do it. Oh, David, because I love it. Okay. I love what I do. I not only love what I do, I mean, look at my 85, for God's sake. I have an album out, in Spanish, by the way, uh, which is uh, produced by uh, Emilio Estefan. Uh, I have a book out, which I know you, you have been carrying around. Right. You do your homework. And, and, uh, and I highly I recommend the book. For people, it's called Rita Moreno, a memoir. And she, unlike everybody else who writes uh, these kind of memoirs, she actually wrote it herself. And I highly recommend it. He liked it, imagine. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, so I have all of these things going for me. What an astonishing okay. life I have. I wake up humming. All right, well, um, you should bottle that. That's pretty impressive. So, so let me ask, let's talk about the award. You've won all these uh, great awards. Which one surprised you the most, uh, all the awards? Were you oh, the Oscar. The Oscar, because I was, at the time that the Oscars came along, I was doing a, another crappy film in, in uh, Manila, the Philippines, where I was playing yet another dusky maiden, uh, a, a, a gorilla girl in the war. 
World War II. And uh, then to my astonishment, I got, got nominated and I was flown in to, to uh, Hollywood to, to, uh, for the night. And uh, I was really pretty sure that he, uh, Judy Garland was going to get it because number one, it was Judy Garland playing a dramatic role in a film called uh, Judgment at Nuremberg. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, she was also in a hospital with the TV cameras there and I thought, oh, I don't have a chance. I completely forgot, of course, that people vote way in advance of, of that night. But uh, I was really pretty sure, but I wanted to be there just in case. And they call my name. I, I damn near wet my knickers. <laughs> Sorry. I could not believe it. I had flown in. I was exhausted. But the time change was immense. And there I am. Well, you saw that. <clears throat> really thrilling and touching speech. I don't believe it. <laughs> I've always wanted to make up for that. I think I have. I have when I did. I got the wonderful award for the uh, Screen Actors Guild uh, Life Achievement Award. But um, the best part of that night is that as I get off the stage, Joan Crawford was there. She was the co-hostess. And I think Rock Hudson, yes, he gave me the Oscar. Rock Hudson was the other host. And uh, she, uh, Joan Crawford liked to drink. <laughs> and uh, vodka was her drink, and she was, had a Pepsi cooler in her dressing room because uh, her husband was Mr. Pepsi. I forget his name, very famous man. Right. You remember his name? No. Okay, doesn't matter. <laughs> anyway, anyway, she had been sort of uh, spiking her Pepsis with quite a bit of vodka. So when I got off stage and into the wings, it was that, those wings, uh, she was drunk as a skunk. <laughs> and a photographer from beyond came over to take a picture of her and myself. And she grabbed, this is a marvelous story, she saw the photographer and she grabbed me and hugged me and, uh, you know, she was built like a linebacker. <laughs> So she's got me in this grip like this. And the photographer says, oh, can I see Miss Moreno's face, please? <laughs> and she's saying, and she's saying, oh no. I mean, she really was crushing my face <laughs> against her bosom, and, uh, such as it was. And, um, <laughs> and she says, oh no. She says, she's so upset. She wanted the picture. Right? So she says, she's so upset, and I'm saying, I'm not upset. I'm not upset. The fact is, no, no, no. They, it ended up that they had to wrest me from her grip. She would not <laughs> let me go. And, you know, they wanted to take me to the press room, because I just won this amazing Oscar, this girl who, you know, half the world hadn't heard of her. And uh, a week later, I was back in Manila, the Philippines, and sure enough, I get this letter from her. She was famous for her blue stationery and, and her notes. She wrote notes to everybody for any reason in the world. And it said, and I, by the way, I never had met her. I never did get to meet her. You know, I, I looked at her bosoms. <laughs> so the letter, the note said, and I'm so sorry this burned in a fire. This note said, darling Rita, how generous of you to come and say hello to me on such a momentous occasion in your life. Thank you, thank you so much, darling. Love, Joan. She was crazy. Well, um, I think uh, her, daughter wrote, her, her daughter wrote a book about that, I think. Her daughter wrote a book, a book and a half about that. Mommy yeah. Dearest, right? Mommy Dearest. So, the woman was nuts. <laughs> let's talk, let's go back to the beginning of your life, really. Um, you were born in Puerto Rico. Yeah. And uh, your mother was only 17? I think born? she was about 17. 17 when you were born. Yeah. So uh, you were living happily in Puerto Rico for five years or so. You thought it was wonderful. Is that right? What city? Oh, it was a lovely, I was born, I was born in uh, Umacao, and then we lived in a town called Juncos, which is right close to the rainforest. And it was an idyllic life for a little girl. The, 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 the fragrances, I mean, you, you can imagine, it's just pure paradise, Puerto Rico. 
And I used to play with these teensy, teensy little frogs that were no bigger than your thumbnail called uh, coqui, because they made that sound. They make coqui, coqui. And, uh, and only an actress would even attempt to do that, wouldn't it? <laughs> and, uh, and it was a wonderful life. And then my mother decided that she, we needed to have a better life. And she took a ship. She left me with my father, whom she had divorced. And uh, she took a ship to New York City and worked in sweatshops as a seamstress. Most Hispanic women, for some reason, have learned to sew from the time they're tiny. And she made enough money at some point to go back to Puerto Rico and get me and bring me back to the United States for this better life that she thought about. So when she did, she told you you were going to go on a trip. You had a younger brother. I had a younger brother named Francisco Alverio. Rosita Dolores Alverio, Francisco Alverio. So she said he would come later. Yes, she said uh, he will come later. So I accepted that. I was five years old. So you went on a cruiser, cruise liner, which is a very big ship. And oh, but you know what? Uh, the funniest things happen. You know, God's editing room sometimes does some interesting things. The moment we were out at sea, we had a huge, really nasty storm. And everybody came from the hold where we were, which of course was not smart because that's when you really get sick. And, and uh, you know, Puerto Rican people, his, yeah, Puerto Rican people specifically, have many, many wonderful things about them. But I think the thing about them that is the most uh, interesting is that they panic. <laughs> <laughs> In the most dramatic way. I And and uh, that's what happened to us on this, the very beginning of this trip. The trip look took about three days longer than it should have because of this awful storm. And we approach the United States, and there is this enormous green lady holding the biggest ice cream cone I have ever seen. <laughs> so you had a luxurious apartment waiting for you? Yes, of course, in a place called the Bronx. <laughs> With lots of your relatives? The Bronx, yes. It was a wonderful, it was a uh, three, four bedroom apartment, but each family had an, a, a room. And my mommy and I had one room also. It was really very tough. It was, it was very difficult, and you know, the, it was cold. I had never seen a tree without leaves on it. And I remember in the bus on the way to the Bronx, I said to my, my mom, I said, what happened to the trees? There's no leaves. And she said, it's called winter. <laughs> and that's when I learned that there was another, a, a, a different kind of weather. We didn't have that in Puerto Rico. We had the rainy season, and we had hot, and we had balmy, but we didn't know about winter. So eventually, your mother worked hard enough, and you got uh, your own apartment. Certainly. We got our own apartment, uh, which is we slept in one little small iron bed, and um, I she sent me to kindergarten. Didn't know a word of English because this was before the Puerto Rican diaspora, so there were very few uh, Hispanic kids in in, uh, in kindergarten, and that's when I really began to uh, understand that this was not going to be an easy life. Well, there was discrimination. People called you names. Oh, I got, my God, I got called names. On the way back to school, on the way to school, usually on the way back for lunch, on the way back from school in the afternoon, there were gangs. And I, you know, I would do a zigzag route to our apartment building because these little gangs would uh, gang up and call me names like Spick and uh, garlic mouth and gold tooth. And you know, I was very young and I didn't understand why that was happening. And what happens when you're very young like that, you are tender and you tend to believe what people tell you. And if they say you're not worthy and that you don't have value, you believe that. So, so I grew up feeling that way about myself. I never told my mom about those nasty but occasions. your mother decided that you might get some dance lessons, and you became a 
child dancer, is that right? I, I was. Uh, a friend of our, hers was a, uh, Irene Lopez, was a Spanish dancer. And uh, she saw me bopping around the apartment one time, and she said, you know, I think Rosita might have some talent. Can I take her to my dance teacher? And my mom said yes, and uh, she took me to a man named Paco Cancino, who it turned out was uh, Rita Hayworth's uncle, because her name really initially was uh, Margarita Cancino. And uh, so he was kind of royalty uh, in dance circles. And that's where I uh, learned to dance professionally. So you started getting some gigs. You were doing bar mitzvahs. I did bar mitzvahs. <laughs> I did weddings, all kinds, Jewish, Catholic weddings. It was, what, eight, nine, ten. So finally, when you get to the ripe old age of about 13, you're mm -hmm. doing Broadway. Yes, my very first theater experience. And what was that like? Uh, uh, actually, well, it, didn't, it, it closed overnight. Oh, <laughs> one show. So it was, it was a shock because we rehearsed for about... Uh, Eli Wallach was in that play. He was very young then. Um, I found out that uh, all of that kind of magic can go away literally overnight. We rehearsed for about three and a half weeks. We opened, and uh, the next day they said, don't come in. So you... And somebody had sent us, a, 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 me, a bottle of champagne, somebody in our family, and that was gone. Now, you had a star actress in that... Uh show who wasn't happy with some of your performance? Your oh, yes, you want me to tell that story? This is, this is marvelous. <laughs> okay, so it's the, the play is about three different families, and it was perfect for that time. It was about an Irish family, about an Italian family, and a Jewish family. And the whole theme is that the young uh, brother of each family is has been killed in the war, and the family doesn't know it yet. So the, each act was one family. Ours was in the middle, which was, <laughs> which was the Italian family. And I was playing a little girl named Angela, and I didn't have much to do. And, uh, but I did notice opening night, because we didn't have previews. We just went right into opening night on this play. On opening night, I noticed that people in the front were getting very restless. I mean, you know the show business instinct that you have, even when you're young sometimes. And I noticed that they were restless and that they were coughing, and I thought, oh my, I, I, maybe I should do something to help the scene. So here's the scene. The mother is heartbreakingly talking to her son, whom nobody else can see, but she's talking to him. And it's a scene where she is her broken heart, and she's saying, but I don't understand. You cannot be dead. No, 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 tell me you're not dead. And I, in order to help the scene, take one thing of spaghetti, a string, and slowly suck it up. <laughs> into my mouth in order to help the scene. <laughs> It worked. Honest to God. I mean, it, it's, it's just, I can't believe I did that. But I really honestly wanted to help it. And people were going, <coughs> you know, and moving around. And I honestly thought I was helping. And she is weeping her ass off. And the boy is saying, but I am dead, and all that kind of stuff. So the curtain comes down on the scene. And I'm walking into the, and always, it's always those wings. I'm walking into the wings. Her name was Lily Valente. She was a well-known character actress. Beautiful looking woman. She spots me and she <laughs> takes me by my skinny little neck. <laughs> and she says, if you ever, <laughs> ever do such a thing again, I will hear about it, and I will find you, <laughs> and I will kill you. <laughs> I was shocked. I really didn't get it. I really thought, but, but, but she don't you talk to me. And that was my very first wow. theater experience. So. <laughs> After I would have done the same thing if I was that, that actress. Imagine! 
Well, sucking up spaghetti while I'm, the other one is crying about her dead son? Oh. Well, after that show lasted one performance, mm -hmm. um, you began to go back and do more of your dance routines in various places. But then somebody got you an interview with uh, Louis B. Mayer. What happened was that uh, a, a, an actual talent scout came to see a uh, dance recital by our dance school, which is what they did in those days. You know, they would go to all kinds of places and see if they could find mm -hmm. new talent. And he saw me and he thought I might very well have a future. He gave my mother his uh, card. His name was Dudley Wilkinson. And uh, he said, uh, the time isn't right just now, but uh, I'll stay in touch with you. And uh, when the time is right, I will call you again. And he was with MGM Studios, the studio of my dreams, because that was the studio that had all of the great, great musicals. And uh, sure enough, about uh, six months later, he called my mom and he said, Louis B. Mayer, is coming to town and I would like Rosita to meet him. And so we did all that we could for me to look like Elizabeth Taylor, who was then my role model, because I had no role models. I, little girls like me had no role models whatsoever, so it was, I chose Elizabeth Taylor. So I had my hair, my mother did her, my hair like hers, I did the arched eyebrows. She had a teeny waist, so we got a, um, we got a waist cincher, and uh, we did some refinements. <laughs> and uh, we went to the uh, uh, Waldorf Astoria Hotel to meet him. We'd never even heard of that hotel. And I remember my mother and the, and he had the penthouse, and we never even heard of what, we didn't know what that meant. So she gets in the elevator and this, she doesn't know what to do. So she goes to the desk, she says, I, we are supposed to see Mr. Louis B. Major, <laughs> but I don't, what, what do we do? He said, penthouse, P-H, ah, okay. So we go up and it opens at his penthouse and there he is, all five foot four of him. <laughs> you know, like the, the, the fellow in The Wizard of Oz, because that's the movie, that, that's the studio that made The Wizard of Oz. And really, it didn't take long. He looked at me and he literally turned me around, took my hands in his, and he said, he actually said, why? She looks like a Spanish Elizabeth Taylor. Right. <laughs> right. Well, smart guy. So how does a seven year contract sound to you, young lady? And you know, I just, I flew. My, I just flew. I just, the dream come to MGM. You have to understand what a studio that was then. It was it for musicals. That was the studio. Fox made musicals, Warner's made musicals, but nobody made, nobody had Gene Kelly under contract. Nobody had Ann Miller, nobody had Judy Garland. That was MGM. So you had a contract and you went out to Hollywood and you're what, you 17 or 18, something? 17. 17. I was 17. You're... In fact, they had to give me a, uh, a guardian because I wasn't 18 yet. Yeah. So you go out and you show up in the commissary and you see Clark Gable? Oh, and... my God. I see all of them start sauntering in, you know, like real people. It was just astonishing. And I'm looking at the steam table and all these exotic foods like roast beef. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, I was brought up on rice and beans. <laughs> And, and then they walk in, saunter like, you know, like, uh, like real people. And who is there? Elizabeth Taylor! <laughs> I thought I would, I died and gone to heaven. It was so thrilling. So you made a couple movies on your contract? I made a couple movies there. I made one with uh, Mario Lanza, who was the uh, tenor of the time, who was actually quite wonderful. But the eater uh, of the times it, as huh? well. The eater and drinker of the times the old as well. Big drinker, big. I mean, he used to eat three pizzas for lunch. <laughs> and uh, he he had a gorgeous tenor. He really did have a beautiful tenor voice. And it was called Toast of New Orleans. And I did a dance there called the Tina Lena, because I was playing Tina, his little girlfriend, until Catherine Grayson came along. <laughs> well. <laughs> That was a big deal then, you know, even, even then. 
So um, this is working out well. You're, uh, you have a contract, seven years, but then all of a sudden they don't renew your contract. And then one day what happened was that uh, I did, two, I did uh, three films there. I did um, Pagan Love Song with Esther Williams. Right. Esther, the backstroke Williams. <laughs> Where I lied, they said, can you swim? And I said, yes. <laughs> and we went to uh, Kauai to shoot it. And the time was coming when I was supposed to do this swimming number with her. Not just I, but you know, a chorus of people. And I had lied in my, through my teeth about being able to swim. Mm. And then I suddenly thought, I'm gonna drown. <laughs> I'm going to fucking drown. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, well, I just better go in the pool, the hotel pool, and you know, start trying to do something. Because I didn't dare tell anyone. So I couldn't have anyone teach me. And I, believe it or not, one night I dreamt that I could swim and I went into the pool the next day and I couldn't do the breaststroke but I could do the backstroke. So in this big a swim number with Esther at the head and all of these beautiful Polynesian looking people and I'm supposed to be a Polynesian girl, there's this, all of these people doing this beautiful graceful <laughs> breaststroke and I'm doing it. <laughs> but it's the only way I didn't drown. And thank God, nobody, probably nobody noticed because there were tons of people doing this. Well, um, whatever reason they didn't renew the contract, it wasn't because of that, right? But you... they, they, they didn't know what to do with me. You know, in, in those days, what are you going to do with this Puerto Rican girl? The fact that I didn't even look exotic didn't seem to matter. I had this name. Oh, which, which was changed, of course. Well, yes, you, you might describe that. It was that. Rosita uh, Moreno was my stepfather's name. So it was Rosita Moreno, and, the, um, and they took me to Bill, uh, uh, what was it, Bill, Bill O'Grady? Grady. Yeah, Bill Grady. the casting director who said, got to change your name, kid. And he says, it's, it's too Italian. <laughs> <laughs> and they suggested some really hilarious names. The only one I really remember was but even I, as shy as I was, turned it down. Orchid Montenegro. <laughs> you know what? It might have got me some jobs. Who knows? There's this girl with this weird name. So you went back east? So I know what happened is that uh, I didn't tell my mother for a couple of months. And I would just go in the closet or in the car and cry and cry. Because it was as though... Mr. Mayor was daddy, and he said, we don't want you anymore. We don't need you anymore. And, you know, of course, finally, I told my mom, and it, uh, it was a very scary time, because I honestly thought, I'll never, how many times in my life have I said, I'll never work again? How many times do actors say that to themselves? Over and over. And it's as though you somehow never learn that particular lesson, because it's always, show business is so, bizarre, it's so odd, it's so demanding, it's so mean. What, and uh, so I started again? to do television, doing westerns, and I started to do westerns outside of MGM. Another thing where I lied, it was a western, and I was playing one of my Pocahontas roles, <laughs> and, you know, buckskins, and boy, if you've ever worn buckskins at five in the morning on location in Kanab, Utah, you could die from the cold. Buckskins are very cold. Anyway, and the feather, I mean, really, the feather. Can you ride a horse? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, comes the morning when I'm supposed to ride a horse with other people. Thank God all these things always happen with other people around. And uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the man who took care of all the horses and stuff, said to all of us, because we were a group, we were a group of about eight people who were supposed to just take off <laughs> the horses. And he said, is there anybody who doesn't know how to ride? Nobody said anything. <laughs> and he said, okay, here's what's gonna happen. We're gonna shoot off a gun, you know, with blanks, and these horses are trained so that when we do that, they just take off. You don't have to do anything. 
You know, just. <laughs> so he goes, blam! And my little horse takes off like a bat out of hell. And the thought, I mean, just imagine this little Indian maiden who normally wouldn't need, to, you know, even a saddle, is holding on to the pummel and saying, ho! Ho! God damn it, ho! And that little horse didn't like me. Because we get to a ravine and he stops like this and I fell over. Oh, jeez. Did you break any bones? I didn't break any bones. Nobody saw it happen, so I got back on the horse. Oh. Well, while you were uh, shooting something, uh, somebody took some photos of you, and the cover of Life magazine had you on the cover. Yes, that was 1954, and, and uh, it was at the time when Desi Lu, the Lucille Ball company, was beginning to branch out uh, to do four camera shows, comedy shows. And they were doing a pilot with Ray Bolger, the, the, the eccentric dancer. And uh, they had me do a, uh, a, a number with him, a dance number. But what was interesting is that he really was a, uh, what do they call it? A hoofer. He wasn't really a dancer dancer. He was a hoofer. There's a big difference. And he kept stepping on my feet and just killing me. And uh, Life magazine was doing a layout on these new shows that were being done for television uh, with this new business of four cameras and all that kind of stuff. And the editors at Life said, who's that girl? Literally. And they said, uh, well, we don't know. Uh, she, she had a small part in this Ray Bolger thing. And they said, uh, take some pictures of her. Because they were thinking of doing a, uh, a layout on Young Hollywood, something like that. And they did. And they took some really wonderful pictures. I don't know if it, one of them showed here. I don't know. And uh, I remember being told, OK, you're going to be on the cover. You're going to make the cover. And I went, oh, Life, Life Magazine was you know, better than people. I mean, it was really, really Life Magazine, who never had actors or actresses on their covers. They had political figures. They had presidents. They had people like that, but rarely, rarely show business people. And they said, you're going to make the cover in two weeks unless President Eisenhower gets a cold. And then you're going to, you know. Well, we didn't, and you got on the cover. And I got on the cover. Saw it, and, and that's when um, Daryl F. Zanuck, Darryl Zanuck of 20th Century Fox said, can she speak English? <laughs> Let's sign her up. And you got a contract. And I got a contract with Twentieth Century Fox. And one of the movies that they produced, where they produced the movie Dancing in the Rain, was that there? Singing in the Rain. Singing in the Rain. Singing in the Rain. They produced that with you. Uh, no, that was MGM actually. MGM. That what, was that was the other picture okay. that I made in uh, at MGM. Singing in the Rain. Singing in the Rain. And what was wonderful about it? That's one of my favorite movies ever, ever. It's a classic. And what I thought would happen from Singing in the Rain, because Gene Kelly put me in a non traditional Hispanic part. I had a red wig and I could actually use makeup of my color for a change instead of that brown stuff they always used to put on me. I thought, oh, my career is made. Finally, I don't have to speak with an accent anymore, blah, blah, blah. Didn't happen. Oh. Rita Moreno was a Hispanic name and that's what they saw. So um, you developed a relationship with a lot of people in Hollywood, and you wrote about that in your book, and we'll talk about a few of them. One of them was, you, one you've already mentioned, Marlon Brando, who was mm -hmm. the love of your life mm -hmm. uh, at that well, period of time. he was the lust of my life. Lust of your life, <laughs> and you were the lust of his life. Big difference. Um, he seemed to have an insatiable appetite, uh, you would say. He had a lot of different women, mm -hmm. and wasn't monogamous exactly. Yeah. What do you and, want to uh, <laughs> So um, that, well, so that actually, Here it comes. that actually produced um, some depression, actually, and you. Well, I actually, one time I found some laundry they did, obviously it was not mine. And I went home, we had, as I said earlier, we had an eight year relationship. Um, and I went home that day just weeping and distraught and devastated and wounded and angry and hurt. 
and didn't know what I was going to do because I thought I cannot live without him. It was one of those dreadful, tumultuous relationships and dependent, interdependent relationships. And something interesting happened the very next day. The very next day, I get a phone call. Hello, Miss Marina? Yes, this is Colonel Parker. Yes, I handle Elvis Presley. Ignore my accent because it's lousy. And I said, yes. He said, well, Elvis spotted you in the uh, commissariat box the other day, and he liked what he saw. <laughs> <laughs> and he would like very much to meet you. Would you like to meet him? And I thought of that rotten underwear, and I said, yes, I would. <laughs> So I went out with Elvis, who was darling. Well, we've already been through that, right? But, but uh, the best part is that despite the fact that there was no social media then, it got out immediately. I mean, the very next day, he took me to this very famous uh, nightclub of the day called the Moulin Rouge. And uh, it was everywhere. It was in Reporter. It was in the Variety. It was in the gossip columns, Rita Moreno, Elvis Presley. And of course, Marlon heard about it, and he got furious. He got furious. <laughs> he threw chairs, which was wonderful. <laughs> That's the kind of relationship that one was. The one with, with, uh, with uh, Elvis didn't last too long. Well. You, but because of your relationship with uh, Marlon Brand, at one point you tried to commit suicide. I did. I and did. It was, it was really that. It was just a... I was so um, engaged with this man, and he with me. It was one of those relationships where one thing fed the other, one person fed the other. It was just a nightmare. And I, didn't, I really wanted to end it and didn't know how. I ended it five, six different times, and I'd go back. And I'd go back, and finally, the uh, the last time I went back, uh, I felt so awful about myself. How could you treat anyone so badly? How could I treat myself so badly that I tried to end my life? And I almost succeeded too. So, um, so you were saved by his. Um... His assistant came in, and I was asleep. I, I took sleeping pills. And uh, she couldn't wake me up. And that's when she called uh, the police and an ambulance and all yeah. that. So you had some other very famous people you got to know over the years. Uh, Anthony Quinn, what was he like? <laughs> Not that great? All right. He was OK. What about uh, Howard Hughes? Dennis Hopper was, oh, go, Howard, Howard Hughes. Hughes. That is such a great story because my agent one day called me up. Hollywood, I tell you, especially in those days, it was so crazy. Um, my agent said, Howard Hughes wants to meet you. And I thought, and I said, why? He said, I have no idea. <laughs> he said, but uh, his, his uh, assistant, a man named somebody Kane, I can't remember his first name, he was a guy who obviously just uh, was like the procurer in a way. Right. He was a real slick kind of man from like from Vegas, and uh, but I didn't know any of this. And um, he said, uh, "Let's make an appointment." He said, "You know, this could be marvelous for you." And I was really scared and nervous because I knew he was a real uh, ladies' man. This is way before Marlon. I was really quite young. I was uh, about 19. And uh, they made an appointment, and I was truly, truly scared to death because I thought somehow he was going to ju jump on me or something. <laughs> and here was, here was how I was supposed to meet him. I was supposed to go to Goldwyn Studios where he had his, all of his, that's, that was where his office was and where he shot some films of his own. 
And they said, go to screening room number five. He will be there. He's watching a, a movie, and that's where he wants to meet you. I mean, it's almost like the movie that they did recently. And uh, scared to death. I kept saying to my agent, you sure you don't want to come with me? He says, no, no, I don't think he wants me to be there. So I find screening room number five. I go in, and the lights are still up. And he has, uh, he has earphones on, because at the point, he was getting quite deaf. And uh, I introduced myself. And he's, he was very courtly. As a matter of fact, he had a high, reedy kind of voice. And he said, I'm about to watch a movie. I'd like your opinion. So we watch a movie with an actress. It was Pagliacci. It was an Italian movie of the opera. And all of the actors were mouthing to the uh, singers. And there was a, a woman there that he was interested in possibly signing, an actress named Gina Lollobrigida. <laughs> She's gorgeous, just absolutely gorgeous. And uh, so I sat and watched this opera. I got bored to death. But I thought, well, OK, you know, I, this, I'm safe. This is, this is good. This is good. And the film is over. And he, um, he takes off the earphones, and he says to me, I'm interested in that girl. What do you think of her? And I said, well, she's, she's very pretty, but she's a rotten actress. <laughs> that was really stupid. But you know what? He said, well, she's, she's really not very good, but she sure is pretty. Don't you think she's pretty? I said, she's beautiful. That was it. So he said good night, literally said good night. I got out of there, went home, and that was that. About a week later, Mr. Kane calls again. He says, Mr. Hughes wants to see Rita again. So this time I was more comfortable, and the agent said, hey, obviously he thinks you're interesting, and he wants to take you to dinner. So I said, that sounds good. OK, I'll do that. Where do I go? He said, um, go to the airport and meet him at Mike Lyman's. That was a restaurant that existed at the time. And it was one of those restaurants. I think it's still there, but it's not the restaurant anymore. It looked like a, um, a, uh, uh, an alien dish, you know, satellite kind of dish. And that's where I was supposed to meet him. So I went in there, and really it was looked for all the world like one of those satellite dishes. And there he is in the corner, waves at me. And I sit down with him. And we talk about electronics. <laughs> Would you like to know how such and such works? And I said, sure. <laughs> and he's, expect he's, he's explaining uh, radio dynamics and all kinds of stuff to me. And I'm like, hmm, <laughs> wow. Oh, is that so? And he was just, he was darling and very sweet. And I remember he said, you're a beautiful child. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be thought of as a child. And he brought me home. That was the evening. He brought me home. And he opens the door for me. And he get, we get to my door. And I said, well, thank you so much, Mr. Hughes. I, I had a very nice time. And he said, what? And I said, and this was about uh, midnight, because all his dates were very late at night. So I said, thank you very much. I, I had a really nice time. And he said, I can't hear you, honey. You have to speak up. So I said, thank you so much, Mr. Hughes. I had a really good time. And four lights went on. In the house. <laughs> and my mother's looking through the, through the sh <laughs> shade. And that was my experience with Howard Hughes. Yeah. No stooping, yeah. nothing like that. Okay, so part of your life has been uh, concerned with other people and for other people. Um, for example, you came to the famous March on Washington in 1963, the Civil I Rights March. I did. What was that like? Oh, my God. Harry Belafonte felt it was very important uh, that there be a Hollywood contingent. He wanted Dr. King to know that uh, it wasn't just 
ordinary working people who, who uh, supported him, but there were people in Hollywood and films who thought a great deal of him. So Harry invited a number of us. Sammy Davis was one of them, Diane Carroll, James Garner, myself. Uh, I don't remember who else, but there were some pretty fabulous people. And we sat no more than 15 feet from Dr. King, where he was speaking. We were on the monument, the Lincoln Monument, with him on the same level. And I'm here to tell you, oh my God, I get such goosebumps just talking about it still. There was a moment when Mahalia Jackson said to him, because he was reading from a text, and she said to him, tell him about the dream, Martin. Tell him about the dream. And that's, I mean, I could just cry. That's when he started to say, I have a dream. I was there. I was there. Well, ah. you've always been involved in, in uh, civil rights and other kinds of I things. And, and now uh, you're still involved in a lot of philanthropic projects. You might mention one or two you're involved well, in. I, I, first of all, let me just say that I, service is very important to me. And uh, uh, I think it's the only thing that makes me, at least, complete. So I, I have projects. I, there's a little hospital that's run by a number of people who are in Rotary, doctors. And I have gotten very involved in it and given them whatever monies I can at the end of the year, I give them enough to really support this little clinic, which is nonprofit. Nobody gets paid. Nobody gets paid, and nobody pays them either. So we're always you know, hanging on the edge and trying to make this thing work, and we do. We actually got some braces for a young girl from uh, Guatemala. They have translators there. They have, uh, but it's all voluntary work, and I love doing that. And the other thing that I'm very, very involved with is uh, the food bank, because I believe with all my heart that you can't think well, you can't learn, you can't do a lot of things if you're hungry. So that's my other, there's two so, things. Now let me ask you, I should have mentioned that you had these relationships with some very famous people, but the person you ultimately married was a nice Jewish doctor, is that right? Which is redundant, yes. Right. <laughs> so uh, you met a man. Um, Lenny was, Gordon, Dr. Gordon, Leonard Gordon. Gordon and, um, your mother was thrilled with you marrying somebody oh, Jewish? Oh, okay. So, all right. We're going to talk about Puerto Ricans and Jews. <laughs> so, uh, a dear friend of mine who was a psychologist, a woman named Leah Schaefer, said to me one day, this was after the Marlin thing, and I was, you know, I was just really very skitterish, and she said, reader, there's a guy you have to meet. <laughs> He's a wonderful, wonderful man reader. You've got to meet him. And I said, you know, I think I'm through with wonderful, wonderful men. She said, no, no she, this guy is really special. And she says, and he's Jewish. <laughs> Jews don't get, Jews don't get panicked. <laughs> like Puerto Ricans. <laughs> they get depressed, but they don't panic. <laughs> and she kept after me, and I finally said, okay, I'll meet this wonderful man. And I had dinner at her house, and I met Lenny Gordon, Dr. Lenny Gordon, who, who, who it turned out was just this lovely man, bright as could be. He was very, 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 very intelligent, very smart. He was witty, and I love humor is to me the most important trait in a man. It's, it makes them sexy to me. Don't really? ask me why. why. I knew you'd say that. Okay. <laughs> well, it's a Jewish trait, too, humor. And I think one of the reasons that, that turns me on is because Jews have always managed all through history to defend themselves, and humor is one of the things that saves them very often. And so when someone can save themselves like that, I feel they can take care of me. 
So I mean, you, it's, it's a real back door, but it's very sexy to me. And your mother was impressed with that as well? No, no. So I said, Mom, there's this guy, and she says, Jew want to see a you? <laughs> What did you say? So I thought, so I said to her, listen, we really have to find a way to make peace because uh, from, for one thing, you're going to love him. You're going, you're going to love him. He's, he's tender. He's warm. He's funny. He's all of those things. But you can imagine that both families, when they found out that I was interested, that this man and I were interested in each other, it's all in the Bronx, the Bronx. One part of the Bronx is going, oi, 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 you boys. The other part of the Bronx is saying, ay, 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 ay. What? So I said to my mommy, listen, here's what we're going to do. We're going to have, I want you to meet him. I want him to, I, I want you to make peace. This is ridiculous. She says, you know, you are right. She says, we got to make peace. Okay. So Lenny comes over, knocks on the door. Mom opens the door, she takes one look at him, and she says, Jew, what are you? <laughs> and Lenny is so nervous, he actually says, Jess, I am. <laughs> but but it, uh, it, it, wor it worked out. You I were... know, I know, it sounds like stand-up. No, it's my life. But you, uh, it's not stand up. You married him after how long a Married period of time? him? Uh, you know him for uh, a few. Oh, wait. You haven't heard the voice of it yet. Right. <laughs> so he, uh, he, um, he invites me that night to a New Year's Eve party the following week. And I said, Yeah, where shall I pick you up? Meet me at the Henry Miller Theater after the curtain comes down. After the curtain? Yeah. So he comes to the Henry Miller Theater, waits in the lobby, and. Uh, no Rita. People are leaving, people are leaving. No Rita. He asked somebody to go down to the ladies' room to see if there's a lady there with big eyes. That's how he described me with curly hair. No, she's not there. And he's thinking, oh my God, I've been stood up on New Year's Eve. Now he's not panicking, <laughs> but he is flirting with depression. <laughs> so I'm backstage saying, I can't believe this. I, am I being stood up on New Year's Eve? And my little hairdresser was taking off my wig, who just macerated the English language. She said, oh, honey, men are all the same. They're all bolivious. <laughs> she meant oblivious, of course. <laughs> so he goes and looks at the marquee and Rita Moreno starring in. He runs backstage, finds my dressing room, and says to me, are you the Rita Moreno? <laughs> I was so charmed because I thought, wow, he didn't even know and he likes me. I like that. So we got married. And Six you, months. You were married for how many years? Uh, 46. 46. He passed My away. only marriage, yeah. He passed away at the age of 90. He so. passed away at the age of 90. And uh, one of the great products of that is your daughter, Fernanda, who is here. Fernanda where is she? Fisher. Where are you, where Fernanda? Fernanda is here somewhere. Where is she there? There she is. Where is she? And. Fernanda um, has given you. What? Fernanda has given you two grandchildren. Yeah. And she lives in the West Coast now, and you've moved to the West Coast. Is that right? You live in, in Berkeley. Yeah, but we still have an apartment in New York. Come on, we can't okay. leave New York. All right. And today, um, what you spend your time doing is performing, uh, philanthropic work, and being a grandmother. And I'm still performing. I mean, I'm, obviously I'm doing this series, but also I still do cabaret. And I do uh, s speeches and, and lectures and all kinds of, I'm very busy. I know. We had a hard time booking you. <laughs> <laughs> so as you look back on your extraordinary career, what would you say is the legacy that you would like people to you know, think about you when you when, Person who That's a good question because I think I think I would like people to think of me in only one way. She never gave up. Perseverance. Right. Right. And um, you're very close. You were very close to your mother. Obviously, she raised you pretty much as an only child. 
Um, did she live to see some of your great achievements? She was right in back of me at the Oscars. Oh, wow. And if you see it, and you can see it on, with my memorable speech, <clears throat> uh, you can see this woman grabbing me and kissing me, and that's my mommy. Wow. Yeah. What yeah. a life, huh? Incredible life, and it's an incredible story. I want to thank we you. We need three more hours. I man. know. <laughs> um, well, look, um, I want to thank you very much for helping inaugurate this series and for being a great Kennedy Center honoree and being a great American because what you've done for the performing arts world and for the philanthropic world is really quite impressive. So well, thank I, you very I, much. Thank you so much, and I have to tell you that I am so proud to be to live in this country with all its warts and all its faults is still the best country. I love it. Okay. Well, didn't you, uh, you sang a song like that in West Side Story, right? I sang a song like that in West Side Story, that's right. So thank you for being here and... Uh, David, you were wonderful. You really read that book inside out, didn't you? It was a great book. I highly recommend it. It was well written and as I say, most people who are famous performing artists, uh, they, they're busy and they don't have time to write a book by themselves or they have the ability to do it. Uh, it's well written and uh, it's a great story. I'm just thrilled that you think it's good. And if you want it, uh, it's going out of print. So you might want to go to Amazon and right. if, you're, if, you're in, if you're interested. Now where is your Oscar, by the way, right now? Do you still have that? It's on, oh, do I still have it? <laughs> okay, well, I don't know. Does the Queen Mother squat to pee? Right. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure, but I guess so. But uh, so you have it. Where do you have it? Yeah, I have it. I have all that hardware on one shelf. It's fab. Oh, my Oscar has a little accompaniment to it. When uh, Justin, our our oldest grandson, who's now 18, was about eight, they, the kids used to come over and stay with us all the time, all the time. We were very hands-on grandparents, and still are. And one day he came by, my daughter dropped him off, and he had a little, uh, one of those little tacky gold plastic uh, trophies for soccer with his name on it. And I said, man, that is so cool. I learned how to talk like that. Right. <laughs> it's so cool. And I said, would you like to keep it here or at your mommy's? And he said, I want to keep it here. I said, oh, okay, where uh, would you like to put it? And he said, next to the little gold man. <laughs> <laughs> It's still there. Still there. Wow. It's still there. Great. The little gold man. The kids used to play with my medals. The younger one used to, there's a real heavy one that I think I got from um, the Library of Congress, which is Living Legends, but it's a big medallion. And the little one used to put it around himself and walk like this. Because yeah. <laughs> it was so heavy and he was so little. Wow. They used to play with all the awards. Well. Thank you for a great evening, and uh, thank everybody for coming. Thank I you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.